Goodness gracious, I feel the Holy Ghost. Would you bow your head? Lord, you're such a good God, and I'm so thankful for that goodness. I praise you for the privilege of being in your house. Thank you that you've allowed us to be. It's a privilege to be here. God, you, you don't have to do what you do, but you do it out of love, and I praise you right now. And God, as we enter into your word, we enter in, into your directives, into your instruction, may we do so with an open heart to, re, to receive exactly what you uh, have purposed us to receive today. And I glorify your name, Lord, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles over to the, uh, the book of James. Fifth chapter, if you have your Bible with you, if not, take note of the screen, it should be up there. I'm going to be reading from the, the uh, New King James Version, all right, just a, just a little bit different if you're into the King James, but I want you to notice something, that there's going to be a commonality thread, all right, throughout all of these verses that I'm going to be reading. See if you can find the thread, if you, if you uh, can understand what links these verses together. Notice this. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call to the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. What is the common thread through those verses? Prayer. Everybody say pray. All right. Prayer is the common thread throughout each of those verses. James is writing. He's writing about suffering people. He's writing about even cheerful people. He's writing about sick people. He's talking about anointing. He's talking about faith. He's talking about uh, the fervent prayer of a righteous man. He's talking about a man of God praying for it not to rain. It did not rain. And then he gets to praying for it to rain. And what, did it, what happened? It rained, all right? And so James is writing consistently about various things that we go through, even in life ourselves. Because there's not a person here that one time or the other has not been sick. There's not a person here that at one time or the other has not suffered. Everyone here, most of us, have gone through some of what James is alluding to here. And yet James has found the secret to success. And that, that secret really is not a secret, but it is the fact that we need to pray about everything that goes on in life. Amen? About everything. In other words, James has said, hey, don't need it out. Just pray. And so today, I want to go back to where I have been up until last Sunday when our guests come in. Well, the Sunday before I didn't get to go there, the Holy Spirit decided that he wanted to do it all, all right, which was okay with me. I don't have a problem with that. But I want to go back to where I was, and I want to talk about the value and the power of prayer. Now let me say right up front, what I want to do is to challenge you, not to condemn you, all right? I don't want you to leave here feeling like, all right, that I'm condemning you because you don't do something that we see where James is encouraging us to do under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But I want to challenge us today. I want us to be challenged 
all right, to come to the understanding of the value and the power of prayer. Have you ever wondered why it is that we have such a hard time doing something so simple as praying? I mean, have you ever really thought about that? Why uh, it is that we can set up a schedule to do almost anything, but when it comes to regular, regimented prayer, we have problems with that. You see, prayer is simply having a conversation, all right? It's just having a conversation. That's all it is, all right? I want you right now to turn around and for about 15 to 20 seconds, I want you to have a conversation with the person sitting next to you. Just turn around. Have a conversation. You can talk about anything you want to talk about. You can tell them their hair looks good. You can tell them they look like they lost weight. You can tell them you're taking the pastor out for lunch today. All right, go ahead. Talk. Just, just, just have a conversation. Okay. Now, some of you are having a problem with that. Okay. But, you know, just, just a conversation. Okay. Now, now, let me ask you something. What's that hard? What too hard was it? Why? Do you know why that wasn't hard? Because that person you're sitting next to, you're familiar with. Most of you know who you're sitting next to. And so you don't have a problem having a conversation with them. Did you know that's all prayer is? Prayer is just having a conversation with your Heavenly Father. It's just that simple. With it being that simple, why do we have such a hard time doing it? Why is it that we have a hard time talking to God? Because most of us don't have a hard time relating to the people that are nearest, uh, nearest to us, okay, of what we want, what we need, what we like, what we don't like. It, it, I mean, we, it, we, some of us are better at telling people what we don't like than what we do like. All right? But nonetheless, prayer is just simply a conversation with God. It is knowing you can talk to Him about anything, anytime, and anywhere. I like this. There are no restrictions in regard to how when or where. Don't you thank God for that? No restrictions. You can talk to God anywhere. You can talk to God riding down the road. You can talk to God taking a shower. Amen. Anywhere, anytime, no restrictions. You see? Why? Because it's just conversation with God. No restrictions. There are no appointments needed. You don't have to call God's secretary and say, I want to talk to God at 1 o'clock on Monday. Amen. God doesn't have a secretary. But nonetheless, there, you, you don't have to make an appointment to pray. In other words, it's just any time, any place, anywhere conversing with God. All right? Amen. Now, in my office, I've, I've got, of course, a phone that's got three or four different lines on it. Okay? I have a certain extension. I'm not going to tell you what that extension is. Hallelujah. All right? Now, to get through to me, you have to go through the secretary. All right? Unless you know my extension. And not everyone does. Okay? And not everyone will. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you have to go through her. If you, you know, you, you, you have to be able to know how to get into that. Call her, she, our church, she puts you through to me. Every now and then, that there's one guy one day, I, I was here on the Saturday, I, you know, and I, I was doing something, and all of a sudden, my phone rang. Now, I knew the only people that had my extension was staff, all right, okay? And uh, they, they, they know how to get up with me without going through the secretary. And so I thought, okay, it's one of them. Or there's one other person, okay, that can get up with me anytime I'm here. She knows my extension. She knows my cell phone number, all right? She knows that if she calls, nobody tells her you got away. All right? She has open line right into my office, okay? I mean, that's just the way it is. My wife can talk to me anytime anywhere that
that she wants to. We have a little line of conversation. But this one call I took on a Saturday, all right, and I hit the button. And this person said, how you doing, Pastor? I'm thinking, how did you get my extension? Uh, how did you know that, you know, which extension to hit to even get into my office? And because this type, this person is someone that has a beginning in conversation, but he never has an end. You ever met anybody like that? You know they know when to stop, but they do not know when to shut up. Okay, and, and this was that type of person. And so, uh, I, I, and basically what he talked to me about could have waited. All right? But when it's all over, I'm thinking, how did he get into my office? Okay? And, and why did I even pick up? You know why I picked up? I thought it was her. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, and, and if I don't answer her calls, the conversation is much longer than when we get together. All right? But nonetheless, I picked it up. Later on, I don't know how I, how, uh, he, why he even told it, but what he did, and don't you do this. All right? Don't you do this. He called the church. And, and, and realized that he couldn't get through to me. So he started hitting every extension there was in the building until he got me. All right? And, and that's, that's the way he got in. He was determined. You know any determined people? All right? He was determined to get. But, but my thought here is, you know what? We have an open mind to God. It doesn't matter. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's simple. You can talk to God. And you know what's so good about it? You can talk to God about anything that you want to talk to God about. There are no secretaries. There is no way that you, you, you have to worry about it. And, and you, you don't have to make an appointment. It is a common as you are choice. And the great thing about God, get this, the great thing about God when you talk to him, it's not a monologue, it's dialogue. Hallelujah. It's not just one talking, but when you talk to God, God talks back. Say hallelujah. It's not a one-way conversation, it's dialogue. God talks back. You say, Pastor, God's never talked to me. Every day God talks to you. You just don't pay any attention. Hallelujah. And you don't maybe realize what's going on. But prayer is dialogue, not monologue. It's not God telling you everything he wants you to do. It's God holding a conversation with you about what needs to be done, how he wants to bless you, wants to heal you, wants to lift you up, lead you out of darkness, give you direction to have hope in this life. Shout hallelujah. See, that's God holding dialogue with us. So, back to the beginning question. With it being that simple, why is it so difficult to do? Could it be possible that we don't understand the value or the power of prayer? Is that maybe the problem? We never yet come to an understanding of what the value of prayer is really all about. Men before us understood it. Jesus himself practiced it and even revealed the power of it and yet we have problems doing it. Today, I want to, I, I want to bring a little bit more understanding into the very power and the very value of us holy communication with God. Talking to God, listening to God. And I pray that we're challenged by the Holy Spirit when it comes to our prayer life. Look at somebody and say you'll never rise in relationship with God above your communication with God. Say that. If, if you don't remember what I say, just say ditto. All right. Hallelujah. Okay, ditto. In other words, God knows what I said. You'll never rise above your communication. You never become intimate with someone unless you communicate with someone. You never really get to know someone until you talk to someone on an intimate daily basis. So my prayer is for the Holy Spirit to awaken in us. All right, this definite part of the lifestyle we need to attain. I like what Pastor uh, T. A. Head said. If the church would only awaken to her responsibility of intercession, 
We can well evangelize the world in a short time. It is not God's plan that the world be merely evangelized ultimately. It should be a constant gospel witness in every corner of the world so that no sinner need close his eyes in death without hearing the gospel, the good news of salvation. Say amen to that. The very lead into that is only awakened to her, the church, responsibility to do intercessory prayer. Praying for a world that doesn't know Jesus. And Drew Mary said this, it should not a proof that the Holy Spirit is to a great extent a stranger in church when prayer for which God has made such provision is regarded as a task and a burden. And does not this teach us to keep the root of prayerlessness in our ignorance and of our disobedience to the divine instruction that God has commissioned to teach us to pray. In other words, we need to learn the value of prayer. If I, if I surveyed this group today, and I came around to you individually, knowing it was between you and I, now, now remember, I want to challenge you. I'm not wanting to condemn you. But if I came around to each one of you and said to you, how often do you pray? In a week. We'll say a week. All right? I, I, I go to a day. How often do you pray? And how long do you pray? What would your answer be? And just think about it for a moment. This is a challenge. How much do you pray in a week's time? Now, let, let, let's tack something on to that. If you have communication with your children, with your spouse, with your, your, your co-worker, whatever, that, that communication is a vital element of your success in those areas, if you spend that same amount of time communicating with people in your daily life, would you have a successful relationship? Just think about it. If you talk to the person that is that is uh, closest to you, or that you need to be successful, would you have a successful existence? Spending that same amount of time that you spend with God. All right, look at somebody and say, think about it. Now look at somebody and say, my bad. Is that what she said? Okay, <laughs> okay, think about it. Now, now, remember, I'm not condemning you, I'm challenging you. Because what I'm doing is I'm showing you what will help us to be successful in our relationship with God. I have no bones about saying this. I believe that Jesus is just about to come. I believe that the church is just about to be resurrected out of here. I believe that for us to go up, we've got to start getting down before we go up. And that getting down uh, is learning how to go to God uh, and communicate with Him uh, about what's going on on the inside of us. Say hallelujah. Yeah. All right. So we need to grab a hold of that. It is because of men such as I just quoted as these that the church in its history has stood in my opinion as pinnacles of truth that have led the multitudes uh, to the foot of Calvary. It's because that men like Billy Sunday, men like Dino Moody, men just like Andrew Murray, that understood the power of prayer that has brought us uh, from a place of loss to a place of salvation. We stand on the shoulders uh, of the men of history that knew how to get a hold of God. God yeah. Amen. We do. Look at somebody and say we do. Hallelujah. So, we need to understand that. I want for just a few moments to talk to you about Jesus, about prayer, and about church. Go with me to the, the 21st chapter of the book of Matthew. And let's notice what the Word of God says in Matthew 21. All right. We're going in, in, into several verses here. In Matthew 21 and 12, and when Jesus went into the temple of God, and drove out those who bought and sold in the 
temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Say hallelujah. He healed them. Say that. He healed them. Okay? Keep that in your spirit. You'll want that in there. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, and say, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. Notice now, Jesus is viewed on prayer, on his house. He steps up to the temple. He steps up to the house of God. Now get this, he's coming in through the front into the temple area. Now, Everything about that temple was controlled by religious people. Everybody say religious people. And the first thing that he does is he notices that there is error or that there is sin going on in the temple of God. And so he comes into the temple and before he prays, before he preaches, before he teaches, he first cleans out clears out all of the imperfections. Or in other words, the first thing Jesus did in the temple is he purified. Everybody say purified. Say it one more time. Now he, he didn't do it very nice, all right? He didn't come in and say, hey guys, would you take up your tables? Would you get out of, move out of here? You know, maybe go out on the street. Uh-uh. He was kind of bold. All right, he was kind of in your face. And he went in and started slinging over tables. All right, and then kind of forcefully cleaning up his house. You need to get this. Sometimes God will not be too nice when you mess up his temple. I didn't get enough amen out of that. Sometimes God's not going to ask you to clean out or to clean up what you knew you, you, you should have already been cleaned out and cleaned up to begin with. In other words, Jesus knew they knew better than to mess up Father's house. And so he wasn't too nice about it. He turns over the tables. He throws them out. In other words, he purifies that house. Folks, I'm here to tell you, this part of the message and, 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 and this part of preaching is not all that popular today. But before you ever have power, you've got to understand the demand for purity. Before God ever dwells in the temple in glorious manifestation, we've got to understand that sometimes uh, he's going to clean some junk out of us and he's not going to be too nice about it he, because we do better than to begin with. Amen. Amen. There are people here, me included, who've allowed some stuff to get in me sometimes. I knew better. I knew better. But I let it live in me, a part of my life, my personality. All right. And I knew I should have gotten rid of it. And yet I'm praying for more of the power. I want God to do a special thing. But I'm saying, God, whatever it takes, never tell God that unless you mean it. Because when you tell God whatever it takes, you just ask Jesus to step in and go over some table. All right? You just ask Jesus to get some junk out of you that should not be on the inside of you. We've got a lot of people praying for revival, but they're not willing to do anything to be worthy of revival. We've got a lot of people that want the manifest presence of God. They want the peace of God. They want the glory of God. But they don't want to do anything for the glory to come on the inside of them. Jesus didn't ask them. Jesus just went in, started cleaning stuff out, pulling stuff out. Why? Because uh, it was not what God said it should be. So what did he do? What did he do? The second thing that he did is that he began 
would, he made a proclamation. Everybody say he made a proclamation. The next thing he did is he made this pro proclamation. He said, I have. He went back to the, to the writings of the Old Testament. He made this proclamation concerning the will of God in his house. And he said, my house shall be what? Amen. Everybody say house of prayer. Now this, 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 this is kind of the rough part. You see, he didn't say it was going to be a shouting house. He didn't say it was going to be uh, uh, anything other than a house of prayer. But what did he do? First he purified it. Then he made a word proclamation. Jesus didn't come up with any new revelation. Jesus went back to what had already been preached, what had already been taught, and he proclaimed what the word had said. Folks, if there's one thing you and I need, it's for a word. That word will define the will of God. And once the word defines the will, then we begin, then we begin to operate in the way of God. If we're not operating in God's way, then we're never going to experience God's will. steps into the house. The house is all messed up. He cleans up the house. Then he starts preaching some word. Look at somebody and say, if you're going to waste anybody's time or if you're going to take anybody's time preaching, preach the word. You see, I made up my mind a long time ago, I'm not going to preach a bunch of fairy tales. I'm not going to preach something that the word of God cannot validate. If I do, I'm wasting your time. I'm not a philosopher, all right? I cannot give you a whole lot of philosophy, but I can't pick up the book open that book up and say, this is what God said. And as far as I'm concerned, if God said it, that settles it. Everybody say, that settles it. And God said, okay, my house is going to be a house of prayer. Now, notice the result. 14 verse, read it to you. After he cleaned it, after he proclaimed over it, what happened? After those things took place, then all of a sudden, the power showed up. Say hallelujah. <laughs> the power showed up. People started getting healed. People started getting delivered. Why? Because he cleaned it. He proclaimed the word over it. And the fruit of the word is the power of Almighty God. You say, what does that have to do with me? God's power will never operate in the church until we preach the word. And the word of God defines the purity of God. And so if we want to become what God has raised us up to become, number one, let's clean our act up. Number two, let's preach the word like we never preached it. And number three, we'll start seeing the power of God like we never seen the power of God before. challenge. I, 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 there's just something about feeling the urgency and the need of prayer that's never before. Now, fourth thing, we've got, we, we've, we've got purification, we've got proclamation, we've got power going on. All in these, these, these few short verses, Jesus is opening up for us as a church exactly what will produce what we need in this hour. But notice this now. Notice this. We got purity, proclamation, or our power, and notice this. Then we got praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, 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 and notice who started praising. It wasn't the know it all preachers. You'd say amen. You're not going to hurt the feelings. All right. Uh -uh. The little children started praising God, the kids started praising. Hallelujah. Do you know a verse, a child? A person with a heart of a child. When the Lord said, Become his little children, all right, which means give trust without question. Children just automatically trust you. They automatically believe you love them. They automatically believe you're going to stand with them. But here we've got purity, proclamation, and power. And now the little children start praising and start magnifying God. Get this, folks. Sometimes, you know, I, I kind of I, I shuffle around a lot. I'm the type that I can't just stand still. Even when I come out, I got to kind of walk. But every man that's out of the edge of my eye, I'm looking at y'all. I'm seeing your reaction to what's going on on that platform. You see, every now and then there's a swoop of God's glory. There's, there's a song being sang that I'm thinking, God, 
Everybody here ought to be worshiping. Yeah. And every now and then, out of, out of the corner of my eye, I see you just kind of standing there. <laughs> Amen. You're not doing nothing. You're not praising. You're not clapping. You're not smiling. If you're doing anything, you're looking at your watch. I wonder how long this is going to be, Merle. Hallelujah. <laughs> Got to get out of here. You're more interested in going down to McDonald's to eat a steak and hamburger than you are to praise and to magnify God. Amen. If you're going to go eat, go eat chicken. All right, at least eat chicken. All right, not on some old bird. But, but what I'm saying is, folks, we, we've got to understand something. This is God's house. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of us magnifying him. And whether you know it or not, he has been healing. He has been delivered. He has been blessed. He has been lifted up. And we don't need to wait on God to do something. We need to praise him for what he's already done and become like a little child and just start praising and magnifying God. I've shared this story with children. You know, I, I, a lot of times I read what children say in church, but, but children tickle me. And, and they, they're just the most pure, hearty, honest people. They, you know, and, and, and they get to watching you, and they like what you're doing. They, they, they're doing it just like you. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, I, I, I've told the stories of teaching. I was in a meeting down in, in, in Florida, and the power of God, the power of God's moving. Let me straighten this up. All right, yeah, that looks better. Hallelujah. All right. The power of God's moving. And I've been praying for a lot of folks, and and they, they're all laying out, you know. And I, I noticed, all of a sudden, I noticed this little girl. She, she, was, she, she, she was about this tall. And she just kind of followed me wherever I went. She just watching me real close, you know. And I'm laying hands on folks. And, and then the altar call changed a little bit. And people started coming into the altar. And they, they, they started coming in and, and kneeling on the altar, you know, and just really crying out to God. You know, it, it, it was back when the altars were used. Okay. Amen. I mean, tears on them, people sobbing. And, and, and by that time, I wasn't necessarily praying for the crowd like I had been. But I noticed this little girl, you know, all of a sudden, she started walking up behind these people kneeling in the altar, and she started laying hands on their head. <laughs> and she's acting like me. Hallelujah. I mean, she gets to pray. Guess what started happening? All of a sudden, they started falling out out in the altar. Hallelujah. But you know what took place? The faith of that child touched the heart of God. And God honored the faith of that child. Why? She had a pure heart. That heart was pure. She might have been doing it like the preacher was doing it, but God was honoring her faith. Amen. I, I saw Preston's little boy Sunday. Preston, you know him. He just a worshiper. All right. And his little boy, uh, Zion. That's right. Amen. 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 Jesus. All right. He's up here with Preston. Just the very, I mean, if you took a picture, you'd have saw a little version of him. God help us all. Hallelujah. All right. The size up here had his hands up just like his daddy did. All right. Preston do this. I do that too. All of a sudden, Preston's in the altar, draped over the altar, side draped just like he did. It was identical. I mean, the arms were the same. The head was the same. The jumping was the same. There's nothing wrong with that. Leave the kid alone and understand that the great boys in peace. What caused it? What caused that power to be made manifest? Purity. Huh? Huh? Proclamation, house of prayer, and then power, and then the praise has started flowing. Now, I, 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 I don't like this part. Look at somebody say, he doesn't like this part. Right. Now, guess what the old heads were doing? Huh? Griping. They were. I'm just telling you, I'm going to show you. Do you believe me? You got to do what you did. Hallelujah. All right. They started complaining because these kids were praising. I'm going to tell you something that's going to surprise every one of you. Every church has a bunch of sour in it. Yeah. This church <laughs> has its share. We got people that come in here, none of y'all is some of this hunting bunch. It's not here. <laughs> <laughs> 
And you can tell them I said so too. Hallelujah. No, no. We've got people that have come in this church, spend more time trying to figure it out whether it's God than they do getting in and worshiping. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I be real transparent? Thank you. Appreciate it. Hallelujah. Because I was going to be in here. Okay. Get this. I'm not going to spend my time. All right, trying to figure you out and lose my privilege of praising and magnifying God. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Uh -huh. These little kids just felt God moving after Jesus cleaned the mess out of the church, preached the word in the church, the powers in the church, and the children started saying, oh, Sam. The children started magnifying God. And the people that were religious uh, started criticizing the kids. Uh, get this, folks. If you ever rise above religion uh, and get relationship, you will be a praiser instead of a complainer. Give the Lord a hand. Get the power of God moving, praise is going to be automatic. And if you ever get God moving in your life the way God wants to move in your life, you're going to be a praiser, and no one's ever going to have to tell you to put your hands up and praise God. Amen. We're moving toward Thanksgiving. Next week will be my Thanksgiving message. I'm going to be preaching a whole lot on praise because I found out something as a young guy getting saved, called to preach, doing all that I do. I found out something. God is moved by my praises. I feel better when I praise than I do when I gripe and complain and fuss about what's wrong. Folks, we spend too much time. Oh my God. Oh my God. We spend too much time telling what's wrong with America, telling what's wrong with teenagers, telling what's wrong with families. Let me tell you something. There's more people good than bad. There's more good things going on in our nation than bad stuff. Uh, okay? Just because the devil controls the news uh, doesn't mean the news always tells the truth. Uh, we need to understand something. Uh, America is still great and good, uh, and the church is still alive. Life, uh, and they're still good teenagers, uh, good couple, uh, good moves of God. Quit zeroing in on the bad and the lovely and start zeroing in on the good and the great. Uh, because God's good, God's great, God's powerful, and God has put himself in us. Uh, and therefore we can be good, great, and powerful. So, so that's Jesus and prayer. All right, but notice something else about this. Notice something else about this. If you get to study in the life of Christ. Now, most of us, when we study it, we pay more attention to what he did than what he was. Amen? But let's, let's talk about what he did, okay? Because that defines who he was. You'll find out in the very beginning of his ministry, in Mark 1 and 35, he started his ministry off in prayer. The Son of God prayed. Look at somebody say, hallelujah. So in the beginning of his ministry, he prayed. In the middle of his ministry, Mark, Matthew 14 and 23, he prayed. At the end of his ministry, John 19 and 30, he prayed. Guess what? Hebrews 7 and 25 tells me that he is still praying. He's making an intercession for us. So he began in prayer. In the middle of it, he prayed. At the end of it, he prayed. And even now, he's praying. So if the Son of God did it, what should we be doing? If he did it, what should we be doing? One more time. We should be praying. Why? Not to please God, but to benefit us. Glory, glory. I know it pleases God because God wants us to talk to him. God wants us to communicate with him. God wants us to take the time every single day to sit down and hold a conversation, to hold a dialogue with him, to tell him how we feel, to tell him what we, we don't understand, what we're going through, what we're faced with. But don't spend all of your time sharing problems. Share the good things going on in your life. Share the great things going on in your life. Tell God how you praise him because he saved you. 
Tell God how you love him and that you're going to love him no matter what comes or what goes. I told God on the, that on the way to church today. I said, God, come what may, I'm still going to love you. Come what may, I'm still going to serve you. I've come too far by faith. I've been ran my race, folks. Uh, glory to God. Uh, he's been a good God to me. And I'm not going to quit praising him. I'm not going to quit magnifying. I haven't reached perfection yet. Hallelujah. All right, you said it louder than anybody else. All right, no. I've not reached it yet, but I'm headed that way. Look at somebody and say, me too. See, we're headed toward that perfection. Now, so we see what, what Jesus thought about prayer. We see how he practiced what he preached. Look at somebody and say, if you're going to preach it, practice it. See, that's our problem. We believe in praise, but we don't pray. We believe in prayer, but we don't pray. Remember, I'm not out to condemn you, I'm out to challenge you. Because we saw what happened when the purity took place. We saw what happened when the proclamation took place. The result was power. And then power automatically generated praise. I want to see God's power because I want to see the needs of people met. All right, Romans 8. All right, go, go to Romans 8 real, real quick. I, 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 you just got to see this. This is so beautiful because this gives us some insight into to the Holy Spirit and prayer. All right. And, and I, I think everybody, everybody needs to understand some of the value of the Holy Spirit and the value that it is to us. And so look over at the 8th chapter, 26 and 27. Likewise. Everybody say likewise. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in your weaknesses. How many of you have weaknesses? Let me see your hand. All right. Hallelujah. <laughs> the rest of you don't have any weaknesses, I guess. All right. But, but notice this. It says, likewise, or, okay, the Spirit also helpeth thy infirmities. Okay. This says weakness. Okay. For we do not know what we should pray for as we are, but the Spirit himself. Everybody say himself. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with getting out groanings and which cannot be uttered. All right, what is that telling me? That's telling me that when I don't know what to pray, when I don't know how to pray, when I within my own meager English can come up with words to express how I feel, the Holy Spirit in me begins to groan and pray and seek God in my behalf. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. See, that, that's the value of praying in the Spirit, of praying in tongues, is when you give out words, the Holy Ghost never gives out words. Amen. Say hallelujah. That's why I, I tell people all the time, listen, listen, talking in tongues is not just a, 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 a proof of what you've got. It is a vital connection between you and God. Hallelujah. You're talking the language that devils can interpret. You're talking the language that devils can understand. You're, you're talking something. The Holy Spirit, third person of the Godhead, is walking around in heaven, hearing the conversation between God the Father and the Son. He comes down and starts praying through you those things that need to be prayed, but you don't have the ability to pray yourself. To me, that's a powerful, powerful thing. All right? He goes on further with this. I mean, th th this is so good. Now, he who searches the heart knows, my God, knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Right? He who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Because he makes intercession for who? For who? All right. He makes intercession for the saints. Who are you? You are saints. Look over to somebody and whatever their name is, say, hello, saint. All right. In other words, go over to turn to Lisa and say, no. Say, hello, saint Lisa. Did you do it? You did it. Hallelujah. We're the saints. And he's making intercession for us. Folks, this is something we don't get today. We think that the Holy Ghost is just getting down and shouting. Hallelujah. We think a move of God is having a good church service and we come in here and somebody just teaches the word and there's not as much noise or emotion. We don't think we've got a good service. But folks, when you understand that the word of God says uh, that God is giving us somebody that lives on the inside of us uh, and when our carnality doesn't quite know how to do it, the spirit
you'll start praying for the will of God to be done in your life. There's been times in my life that I knew God wanted me to do something, but I, I couldn't quite get it to, together in my head. And I'm the type that once I get it, I got it, and I'm going for it. Hallelujah. That's just the way it is. But get this. The Holy Ghost will begin to pray God's will. Huh? Now, get this. Amen. What the Holy Ghost prays, God reveals. Eventually, it's going to be revealed the very thing that you were praying for. God's going to begin to reveal what his will is in your life. All right? So he begins to pray that will of God. Next verse. Next verse, Tim, if you would, please. Amen. Let's, let's run on. Begins to pray the will of God. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, and we know that all things, look at somebody and say all things. And we know that all things, said again, all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to the according to His purpose. Everybody say His purpose. So what are we saying here? We got the Holy Ghost showing us the very value, all right, of prayer. For He burst within us a desire to pray, and as we obey, we did move into a place of discipline. All right, we discipline ourselves to begin to seek God. And when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit in us begins to pray. I like the definition of the word discipline. It means the power of controlling one's actions, impulses, or emotions, or to cause to acquire knowledge or skill. So when we start disciplining ourselves and allowing the Holy Spirit to pray through us and pray the will of God in us, then all of a sudden we begin to act the way that God wants us to act. And that's an extreme value there. That's what we as a church and as a child of God needs to grab a hold of. All right, and not only that, but it, 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 it then comes to delight us in the things of God. And, and the Holy Spirit, in other words, stirs itself into why am I teaching on prayer for? Because I want you to understand the value and the power of prayer. Remember, I started this off without, uh, with the, the, the Connie, uh, uh, a man of history that drew a circle around himself, crawled over in that circle, and they'd been without rain for years. Food was wasted, gone away, and he said, I'll never come out of that circle until rain starts to fall. He stayed in the circle until the rain didn't take too long. Why? Because he had a made up mind. He understood the power and the value of prayer. Everybody standing all around the building. Give the Lord a great big hand clap because he is. Now, now, there's no way, there's no way I can ever exhaust what the Word of God says about prayer. There's no, no way I could ever do it. I found out something in a long time ago as a pastor. You, you preach on healing, you preach on power. You preach on things that doesn't uh, take a whole lot for us to operate in, so to speak, and, and we get carried away with that. But if you ever preach on prayer, if you ever preach on study the Word of God, people will almost shut down on you. They do not want you to talk about what they have a problem doing. But folks, the most important thing that we can do as a Christian is study God's Word and pray. You cannot do anything any more important. And then you say, what about shouting? What, 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 about, what, what about dancing? What about, uh, what about talking in tongues? Let me say it again because you probably didn't hear me if those were your questions. The most important things you can do is pray and study God's Word. You say, which one is the most important? Prayer? Prayer is very important. The most important. You say, why, why do you say that? Because if you don't communicate with God, you don't understand what God says. You never understand the word until you start asking God to reveal the word to you. You see, and, and, and this this is this is me, okay? I'm an early morning person when it comes to my, my devotional and my prayer time. I prefer mornings. End of day, forget it. All right. I've been had too much to go on. I, I'm used to not in bed till 11 or 12 o'clock at night. And if I put that down as my prayer time, I wouldn't give God anything. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm zoned out by so I prefer early morning, and my, my preference is 5.30 to 6 o'clock in the morning, okay? And, and that's my particular time. That's, my, that's what I call my quality time. I like to be up in my, in my 
uh, study area by 6, 615. And I'm not saying that and say, oh, look at him. Has nothing to do with it. I'm going to show you something here. I have found out something. If I start the day out fresh, most of the time, I get fresh things from God. It is very rare that I do not get the sermon of the word that I'm going to preach to you. It's very rare that it doesn't come in the early hours of the morning. And God has been speaking some revelation in me for about three weeks now. And I've been writing things down. I have not been able to share them yet, but they are coming. But what I'm saying, don't give God what you have left over. Don't give God what you have ended up with after you spent your whole day taking care of yourself. Spend eight hours on the job. Spend three or four hours cutting the grass or hunting or fishing or whatever. Uh -uh. If you're going to give God anything, give him your first fruits. That's what he demands. God doesn't want the fruit left on the tree that no one else wanted. God wants first fruits. And in my opinion, early morning for me. I am fresher in the early morning hours. I am more open in the early morning hours. I am more sensitive to the Holy Spirit in the early morning hours than I am any other time. Once 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock hits, my whole world changes. Alright? Everything changes. Everything moves into another gear. And I know that if I don't get my time in with Him, before 8 o'clock, I might as well forget it. There's too much going on. It doesn't mean I'm not operating in anointing. I'm not operating in spirit. It just means I'm having to share it. All right. With God, a part should be His. And, and, the, and, and what I do, and this works for me, it really works for me, is I say to the Holy Spirit before I pick up the Word, I say, Holy Spirit, whatever I'm going to read today, and I'm an Old Testament, New Testament person, I try to pour both in me, all right, in one setting. And then I used to have another book I'm reading to pour more of what a man of God has written that would be beneficial to my relationship. And I say to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I don't get all of this, but you do. So reveal this, open this to me. And what happens is you go in with a sensitivity that you would not have gone in with had you not prayed before you stepped into God's direction. Now y'all understand what I'm saying? You can't understand what God says until you communicate with Him, and then He can reveal it to you. The value and power of prayer. I don't think I can preach on that too much. You see, God wants you to understand what He's done for you. God wants me to understand what He's done for me. Every head is bowed. Holy Spirit, thank you for the word today. Thank you for that word of God that is. Such a challenge to all of us. And Lord, I, I know that you never give us anything without the intent of it creating success in us. And with it creating joy, peace, healing, deliverance. Let that take place. And Father, as I'm praying, I'm talking to you in behalf of backsliders, in behalf of sinners that just may be here today. Lord, help them to understand the power and value of prayer. Prayer demands. Our repentance demands communication. It demands us saying we're sorry. It demands us turning from our wicked ways. God, so help people to understand that have lost their relationship with you, that they can only gain it back by communicating with you, talking to you, confessing with their lips the error that is in their life. So if there's one here that doesn't know you, may they leave here knowing you in the name of Jesus Christ. I want the ministry team, those of them that are here, to come and stand and just face out of the congregation. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus, if you're a backslider, if you're a sinner, if you're someone that is called and indifferent and you're lukewarm, God brought you to Messenger Church for a purpose. He brought you here to heal you, to save you, to bring you from your place of incarceration. You see, the enemy has you in a prison. And he has you to where you can't 